Documentary maker Ken Burns is focused on prohibition in America, but that's the big picture. Here at North Carolina now, we want to see what local or statewide links to prohibition we could find. You know what? We found a big one. It's this relatively new business in a really old building with a really great history. Next on North Carolina Now. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Nashville's Pax Tavern is a brand new business when you compare it to all the years of history its building holds. Is this building as old as it looks? Uh, absolutely. The, uh, it's actually two buildings. The north building was built, the, the building that faces the park was built in 1907. The building uh, just to the immediate south was built uh, about five years later, 1912. Throughout the 20th century, different businesses and their owners would renovate and modify this old building. What did you think the first time you walked in this building? How we're going to do this. <laughs> because it really it was cut up into uh, all kinds of small offices. Before this, it was the uh, city and county parole offices. So everybody had an office and uh, all that had to be torn out and got down to the bare minimum. It's come a long way since uh, it's when we started this project to become a restaurant today. So. It turned out the owners of these old businesses decades ago would not rip out of the old renovations. They'd simply add layers of construction. We sandblasted the original brick. We took up three layers of hardwood floor to get to the original. Literally a hundred years of, I guess, progress rolled back to the original state. Yeah. This building has been a, a lot of things to a lot of people over the years and we've essentially taken it back to what it was 100 years ago and we've exposed all the original elements of the building, the original floors, original ceilings, so we really made the building what it used to be. The legal activities that happened in the Pax Tavern building are known to historians. But it's been a barbecue joint, it's been an automotive place, they sold tires here, uh, it's been a mill, a lumber mill, um, many, many things. This building uh, it cleaned up real nicely for us when it came down to it and plan A was not going to be the plan anymore and plan B became a tavern in a hundred year old building. Um, we took a, an old tired building and made it beautiful again. Stuart Coleman co-owns Pax Tavern. He and his son-in-laws, Tom Israel and Ross Franklin, first believed this old building needed the bulldozer more than a renovation. And before running a restaurant, they were condominium developers who had never thought of a prohibition-themed tavern in a prohibition-era hangout. I bought a building that was in terrible disrepair, and we, we, I'm embarrassed to say this, but we bought it to tear this building down so that we could build a condominium. What happened to change your mind? Uh, the condominium market disappeared, and, and, and we got in the restaurant business. What was saved in this building because the condo couldn't be built? You know, original floors, all the original beams are the same. Uh, a lot of the uh, brickwork is all the same. The only thing really different is you, we put in some windows. This used to be just totally a brick wall over here. We didn't really even know what we were getting into until we started tearing out and realizing the ceilings were 23 feet instead of 8. And, things of that nature. And the developers didn't realize the significance of what they'd find in the basement and how it would spark their creativity. This just kind of jumped out at us. This, this giant tunnel in the basement made its history clear. The Pax Tavern basement features an old entranceway to a tunnel system that was used to run bootleg liquor underground between downtown Asheville buildings. The entrance features two heavy iron doors. Stuart Coleman gave us a tour. This tunnel here, it had uh, access to a series of tunnels on the other side, and it had a double locking mechanism that locked. Um, you lock inside. You lock yourself in and you lock other people out. So these tunnels, were they really a secret to the authorities or were they a secret officially, but everyone knew what was going on down here? Uh, they were not secret. 
because they run even under the Masonic Temple and they run uh, up here in front of the Biltmore Building and they discovered them in the park when they were redoing the vitalization of the park. Uh, there was a series of four tunnels that crossed over each other and they were severed also by utilities. When those old tunnels were open, partiers and bootleggers could quickly flee from building to building, popping out down the street far away from where a booze crackdown would be underway. It's the federal boys that were required to do from time to time raids. G-men. Yes, and those were the individuals that they announced their presence and that would allow the building to empty through these tunnels. The tunnel system did not survive Asheville's 20th century modernization. Only the entrance at Pax Tavern and probably a few other buildings in the immediate neighborhood might have doors or other evidence that such tunnels existed. And to think, this entrance that somehow survived last century's progress got a second life from a 21st century date with urban renewal efforts, thanks to a really bad recession. We're happy that we were able to retain uh, some part of the history of Asheville that would have probably disappeared uh, during the development of, of, that, of that condominium. So one silver lining in this big old great recession we've experienced. Uh, it was more than one because had I been in the condominium business right now, I'd be in real trouble and I'm in the restaurant business and we're having a great time. What is it about prohibition and all the gangsters that make people today romanticize so much about? Well, you know, part of the economy, I think, today even. You know, when we built this place, one of the things we were looking at was the whole idea that that time we were kind of there again and we kind of did this whole thing just to around that. And so what in reality was people years ago sneaking around to drink booze and criminals supplying them with it has turned into almost folklore almost 80 years after alcoholic beverages were made legal again. While prohibition as a federal policy has been chalked up as an overall failure and repealed, it gave rise to modern mixed drinks, some of which are still served today, like the French 75. A French 75 actually named after a powerful, hard-hitting artillery piece from World War I, the only drink that came out of Prohibition to actually still be made in bars around the United States today. A French 75 is made with beef eaters gin, a little bit of simple syrup, just a dash. We put champagne in it and always make sure to put it in a chilled glass. Always make sure to put it in a chilled glass with a straw, French 75. Rob Neufeller is an author, historian, and correspondent for the Asheville Citizen Times. Did Prohibition in North Carolina do what it was aimed to do? Well, according to some moonshiners themselves and some of the agents, the bootleggers who delivered it, there were hundreds of gallons coming into Asheville every week. They would have a convention and they would have 50 gallons come in just for that convention. Now you figure you have a few hundred people, everyone's drinking about a pint at these conventions. So there was, there was not any attempt to actually stop the drinking that took place in hotels and places where the conventions met, because that was business. I mean, there were some people who said, if you stop drinking in the tourist towns, you will kill those towns. It's death to a town. Were the parties back then, you think, different than the parties you see in a nightclub or a bar now? I mean, what would make people think we need to get rid of alcohol? Well, you know, there, there was also the, the ministers. But they're still around. They're still around, but they were pretty strong back then, and then there were the women. It, it, it really is difficult to determine the degree to which there were disorderly and even violent men that the women felt that they needed to do something about. Back then, the industries were really coming into the area, and, and they wanted, you know, a good workforce. At the same time, they wanted, they had the tourism industry, so they wanted to uh, keep down anything 
that would create a bad reputation. People panicked in the streets about people stumbling out of bars and they're going to beat me well, you up. You know, one of our most famous examples is Thomas Wolfe's father, W.O. Wolfe, and he would go into drunken rages. And so you know, Wolfe was born in 1900, so he was growing up in that first decade. And, uh, and, and at that time, there were like 14 saloons just in downtown Asheville alone, 14 saloons. And, you know, so W.O. Wolf would go into these uh, bars or saloons now and then and get drunk, and he would come out pretty raging, you know. Early in Look Homewood Angel, there's that scene with him, um, uh, W.O. Gant, you know, chasing his wife around with a, a, a fireplace poker. So, I mean, it caused a stir. Um, she didn't seem particularly nervous. No one ever thought he was going to do any damage. But, you know, yeah, there was some drunkenness. And, but it's, it's hard to tell how much. And it, but, but the thing is, is that a society that allows itself to celebrate in that way, even with moderate amounts, is a different sort of society than the industrialists were bringing in because they wanted a sober workforce. They wanted the Victorian model. And you know, the Victorian model is not necessarily that ideal. You know, you have the stern ministers, and, but you also have, you know, those workplaces. You have workmen who are pretty much controlled. Today, Asheville is not known as a conservative political town. What was it? Was it a conservative town back then? Was it a liberal progressive town? Would this town have embraced prohibition? Sometimes Asheville was the place that was more wet. Sometimes it was the place that was more dry. Asheville pla passed prohibition uh, about three quarters of a year before North Carolina passed prohibition. They passed it in October of 1907. And there was a big vote, and this is the craziest thing. The, the wets came out and the dries came out. And supposedly, you know, the night before, the wets had this big rally in the old opera house, which is now gone. And the dries, the women and their children, they were marching with torchlights down Patton Avenue. It came to the time of the referendum, just for Asheville now, and the, you know, the wets were wearing the red bands and the whites and the dries were wearing the white bands, and the dries had women and children. And the children, in this one instance, with this guy who owned a saloon downtown, they evidently you had to get a ballot from someone, either a wet or a dry ballot. The children would surround these leaders who were going to vote um, wet, and they would like uh, sing songs, they would pray, they created this scene. This Why swing an election? This would not be legal today. <laughs> now, I read that in connection with the 1907 Asheville thing. The state thing, I didn't read about the kids surrounding, and they once actually uh, sang taunting songs. Not taunting, really. They sang a shaming songs about this particular man who was going to vote wet, and they included his children's names in the song. I mean, they knew who he was. I know you, Mr. O'Connell. I know your kids. But in the 1909 statewide election, I mean, you see statistics. Marshall, up in Madison County, voted like 500 to zero in favor of statewide prohibition. 500 to zero. So you know there was something fishy going on. Rob, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing okay. your expertise. Can I get you guys anything? I would love a sidecar. Please. Ah, sidecar. Actually, the quintessential prohibition drink um, made with Cointreau and Corvassier. Here at Pax Tavern, we actually put a little lemon in that and salt, uh, sorry, put sugar on the rim. Yeah. Absolutely. So, as I said, a little Corvassier, ounce, ounce and a half of Cointreau. We put some lemons on here at Pax Tavern. A little lemon juice. Sidecar, quintessential drink of the Prohibition era. Welcome to PAX. Moonshine has been a popular, if illegal, alcoholic drink for generations. But moonshine making may be about to go mainstream with a few legal North Carolina distilleries popping up to offer the product commercially. We can see our temperatures in the, in the distillation column at the deflagmator. Troy Ball is the first woman in America to try her hand at making commercial moonshine. She wants to break the mold and upscale the drink's historic standing 
and she wants a bottle of her moonshine sitting on the top shelf beside the finest distilled products. Years ago, people really dumbed down the hillbilly. And, um, and even today, there are companies out there that are trying to make a dollar on the hillbilly corn cob pipe, you know, mountain man. And, and that's not what we're trying to do. We're really trying to honor the tradition of the earliest um, whiskey makers in America. The distillery might be named for Troy and her children, but Troy and Sons is a partnership. Charlie Ball is part of that team. He's Troy's husband and a businessman. He says Troy focused on making moonshine just a few years ago, then went looking in the mountains for bootleggers who teach her the traditional art of distilling. This was her idea. I thought it was nutty. Tried to talk her out of it. Couldn't see where it, there was a business model there. Do you have that innate quality about making moonshine, or is this learned and you're just a very smart person who figured out the chemistry of moonshine? No, I, ha I had to learn from the old guys. I mean, I mean, really, literally, we built um, stills out of old whiskey barrels and piped them the same way that the uh, moonshine guys made their steam stills in the early days. The balls learned there's a knack to distilling moonshine, but found there's a science behind all that artistry. They went high tech when they opened Troy and Sons, but learned that Charlie's nose and Troy's tongue were perfect gauges in crafting their moonshine recipe. I'm probably first on the line because it's coming off the still, uh, but she's really, she's got a great sense of taste. She's never really been a drinker, so she's preserved all those taste buds that many people have ruined by now. We did 20 distillations with the new equipment. We did 33 distillations with the old equipment. And it wasn't until we had the, the uh, 54th distillation that we really got it like we wanted it. The Balls call their moonshine a super premium product and believe they can take it nationwide without sacrificing that historic name. Does moonshine help you or hurt you as a name? I, I, I think if we were making this in LA, Moonshine wouldn't make sense, but we're making it in the mountains where it was originally from. You know, we're in the epicenter for moonshining. Uh, even today, it's still an active practice from Georgia to, to Virginia. But for Troy and Son Distillery to succeed as a national moonshine maker, they must convince mainstream diners and drinkers that moonshine is not a gimmick. Usually selling alcohol is something either you sell it in mass or you don't make a dime on it. What made you think you can tackle that? Well, no one's, no one's figured out how to make a great moonshine in the marketplace, a, as we call it, super fine moonshine. So we're taking principles that come out of um, European, European distillation techniques with equipment, where they're making very fine fruit distillates, and we're applying that to grain. Do you see this as competing with bootleggers that are still out there, or is this a whole new world in cocktails you're trying to introduce? I, de I definitely think this is a this is a new thing. It's uh, I don't see us as competing with bootleggers at all. Um, there'll always be a place uh, for American bootleg, in, and there always has been a place. But uh, this is a way to get moonshine out to the rest of America. In Asheville, legal moonshine is being served as a replacement for vodka and gin in mixed drinks. We drop by the Tupelo Honey Cafe, where mixologist Stephanie Parsons is using Troy and Son moonshine in her drinks. How do people view moonshine these days? Well, I guess it depends on if they drink it. I mean, it's been pretty popular for us so far since we've had it. I mean, since we've gotten it. Um, people are interested in it, they want to try it, they want to know the story and why is it legal and who's making it and what are we doing with it, so. I sense customers tiptoe into it, they just don't dive into a moonshine order. Yeah, I mean it, it helps to, uh, to fluff it up a little bit at first. You know, I've had a couple of people come in and drink it straight. Old time tradition suggests you sip your moonshine straight, but if it's to go mainstream, it still may need the help of a chaser or the support of a recipe like the Prohibition era favorite, the Tommy Gun. The reason that we call this a Tommy Gun is if you have a couple of them, you don't have to worry about who's shooting at you. We make a Tommy Gun with Troy and Sons moonshine, a little lemonade, put it in a martini glass for you and here at Pax Tavern we take a couple of extra lemons along with our lemonade squeeze a couple of lemons in 
and pour that into a martini glass. So. I like to put a lemon on the top of that just so you can go right around the rim. A Tommy gun. It wouldn't be fair if we didn't conclude our tour by meeting and talking with someone who can identify with and has indeed lived the culture of moonshine and bootlegging in Western North Carolina. Looking great. <laughs> this is Cookie Wood. How do you wind up a bootlegger and end up staying one for so long? Well, it's just uh, using your skull, I reckon, you're using your head about it. Is it a business? Is it a lifestyle? Well, it, ha it always has been. It's a way of living. It used to be a good way of living. I mean, the most people that done that have done it for a living. So it wouldn't be a hobby, it'd be a business. Yeah, it's kind of a business that uh, put food on the table back when I was raised up. How long have you been around bootlegging at one time or making distilled spirits? I've been, I've been around it ever since it's about nine years old. I used to carry it for old people. You know, it made it. Carried, you know, to play with it if they needed it. Wanted it, sold it out, I'd take it to them. What kind of person would drink moonshine versus holding out for a bottle of rum or whiskey or vodka or some other spirit? I guess they just they just like moonshine. These people right now are sitting down a bottle of George Dickens to get a sip of moonshine. The perfect moonshine tastes like what? Well, kind of like, if you do it right, it's kind of like Jack Daniels. Is the idea of drinking moonshine becoming less popular or more popular these more days? More popular. More popular. They, a lot of people are putting them up, you know, and are getting the government to let them make it, whatever. Makes it legal moonshine. They're making legal. Yeah, they're trying to, but a lot of them don't know how. And they get... Now, theoretically, if you made a few gallons of moonshine, why wouldn't you just step forward and pay the federal and state excise tax. On. Be no fun. <laughs> Be no fun of doing that. That put him out of business. <laughs> Is it enjoyable to make moonshine? Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's something another to think about. I mean, it, you have to be pretty good at it. And, and if you're pretty good at it, you're proud of it. Do you feel that state and local law enforcement take a whole lot of time to go trimpsing around the woods and the mountains looking for stills or? You know, the people don't tell on you or something or go to griping about it. No, they ain't gonna say nothing. Nobody does. What would get a bootlegger in trouble? Well, the people get you in trouble if you're, if you're selling that. That's what got me in trouble a long time ago. A long time ago? Yeah. You were selling it. I was selling it and then uh, had a fella come and bought some. Well, he was a real close friend of mine and he had uh, sheriff with him when he come. Now when they get you, are they mean to you? Do they throw you on the ground like on TV? Or are they sort of like, all right, you got me, and they tear you still up and tall you in? No, sir. No, they, when they got me, I just, they treated me just as good as it, me and you are right now. But they caught you. But they caught me. Yeah, but you know. What makes a good sip of moonshine? Run it on corn, cap it with a good malt, and run it right, and a good clean steel, a good copper steel, or a stainless steel. But stainless steel ain't gonna ain't nothing comes out of it. But run it on stainless steel or something like that. It'll be clear. Keep it clean, and you and that's what makes a good sip of moonshine. Moonshine is how old when it's really at its best. Well, just about time it comes out of the steel. So either you've made it smooth, or it's not going to be smooth. That's right. You've got to make it fit smooth. Where do you see moonshine fitting in this 21st century? Oh, I believe it'll get a little better. I think it will. High tech? Yeah. Or just old men passing it down to the young men who well, learn a little better and then teach the young kids well, to Well, that's, that's the old tradition, you know, the way it was. That's the way it's been all, ever since I was growing up, they, they just passed it down. That's the way I got started then. Would they expect you, not the old men that you learned from, would they expect you to make moonshine almost as well as they did? Or would they expect you to learn it and maybe do it a little better because you could build on what they taught you? That's right. They wanted you to build it right. They wanted, to, they wanted it to be that way. 
if you're going to tell somebody who wants to get into this theoretically, what would you say would be the number one thing you need to do to be a success and a long-term success at it? Get the right kind of rig to run it on, a copper or stainless steel, like I say, mm -hmm. uh, and fix it till it won't hurt nobody. Nothing on you till they get too much of it. <laughs> now, what would be the biggest mistake you can make that would end your dreams if that were such a thing? Make it on something other that would hurt somebody. I mean, you know. Like you get lead in it. And yeah, like line. lead or something like that. That's, that's, that's what you have to watch. Because if they, they might make some, but it'd be, be poison, <laughs> really. But if you're sneaking around out here buying a quart of moonshine from a bootlegger, how do you know you're getting anything good? That's a problem. That's your problem. You, you don't want to just get it everywhere, I don't think. Cookie, it's a real treat to talk to you. Yeah. And I appreciate you coming out of Haywood yeah. County to come see yeah. us down here. And so we come full circle with this discussion of moonshine and prohibition. History is teaching two lessons. That first, it can help modern day businesses grow and even thrive while reminding old alleged bootleggers that sometimes the old ways are the best ways of doing business. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.